Our speaker for today was born in Italy on November 23, 1942. He was ordained priest on April 27, 1974. He became the spiritual director of Don Bosco Makati on July 1974. Then after three years, he was assigned at Don Bosco Mandaluyo, where he served as its director for eight years. In 1985, he was appointed as novice master in Don Bosco Canluba. In 1987, he became provincial superior for eight years before being assigned as director of the seminary in 1993. He stayed and served for a year in very help of Christians Paranaque before he was sent to Papua New Guinea in 1997. He was appointed Bishop of Alutau from 2001 to 2010. He became Delegate as Coadjutor Archbishop of Rabaul in 2011 and served as Archbishop of Rabaul from 2012 until 2020. Archbishop Panfilo is known as the Island Bishop. In the two dioceses he took care of, namely Alotau and Rabaul, he visited, served, and assisted the faithful in many ways. He did his best to reach out to the natives by proclaiming the Word of God, celebrating the sacraments, and building the Christian community. True to his motto, Duk in Altum, or set out into the deep. Some of the provinces there are located in the deepest depths of the jungle and in the highest mountains. The people loved him because he was the only bishop who went to the remote areas where no other archbishop has gone before, not even politicians. The natives admired him because despite him already in his 70s, the rugged terrain did not stop him from visiting them. He truly left an indelible mark in the hearts of the people. Now presently retired, he stays at Don Bosco School of Theology as its resident professor. But his work continues in promoting the importance of taking care of the environment. Brothers and sisters, let us all welcome our speaker for today, Archbishop Francesco Antin. In 2019, I was invited to give a lecture uh, to the Catholic Theological Institute of, uh, in, in Papua New Guinea, in the capital of Papua New Guinea, in Port Moresby, and uh, about my involvement in the implementation of Laudato Si uh, in the area of Pomio, that is, uh, in, it was in the, in the Archdiocese of Rabaul, in the south coast of the Archdiocese, where there is a huge uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, project uh, carried out by uh, a multinational uh, from, uh, uh, from Malaysia. And so uh, this lecture was called the Sinkai Lecture because Sinkai was uh, the first uh, uh, indigenous bishop of the island of the Diocese of Bougainville and uh, who suffered a lot during their uh, uh, civil war, because there was a civil war on the island of uh, Bougainville in the, in the 90s. Anyway, so this, uh, I would like, uh, the purpose of this uh, lecture was to explain my involvement in the implementation of Laudato Si. And so I would like now to present what I said on that occasion. I would like to start by quoting the encyclical letter Laudato Si of Pope Francis. He wrote, For indigenous communities, land is not a commodity, but rather a gift from God and from their ancestors who rest there, a sacred space 
with which they need to interact if they are to maintain their identities and values. A quote from Laudato Si 146. Indigenous people extract their subsistence, their livelihood, from the land. To the Melanesian people, land means life. This means that it must be cared for and protected. This is why Pope Francis asks the question, what kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us? We are required to be good stewards and to leave behind us an, an inhabitab inhabitable planet for future generations that will enable them to live in a manner which ensures the welfare of all members of a community. And this is why Pope Francis states that when establishing a project, some crucial questions need to be asked. They are questions that probably I mentioned in the first uh, lecture. Why is, this, is the project taking place? What will it accomplish? Where is the project located? Who will benefit from the project? What are the risks? What are the costs? Who will pay this cost and how? Again, this is a quote from Laudato Si 185. Laudato Si emphasizes the fact that the Church is not opposed to development. However, as Pope Francis says, when planning a project which has environmental implication, and I quote, a consensus should always be reached between the different stakeholders who can offer a variety of approaches, solutions, and alternatives. The local people have a special place at the table. They are concerned about their own future and that of their children, and can consider goals transcending the immediate economic interest. Laudato Si, 183. I think that this quote, uh, uh, these words of Pope Francis are really very, very important. The points made by Pope Francis in Laudato Si are fully in accord with the national goals and directive principles contained in the Constitution of Papua New Guinea, especially the second national goal and directive principle, namely equality and participation. This national goal and directive principle emphasizes the need for an equitable distribution of incomes and other benefits of development among individuals and throughout all parts of the country, equal access to the different governmental services and the equalization of these services. And thirdly, people being able to become involved in projects and businesses which will both be beneficial to themselves and contribute to the common good of the community and the country. So, the overall goal is for every citizen to act actively participate in the political, economic, social, religious, and cultural life of the country. That is in the Constitution of Papua New Guinea, but obviously this is, is social teaching of the Church as well. Unfortunately, these goals and principles, along with the processes through which they should be implemented, have not been followed with the Sikite Mukusoil Pan project in West Pongyo. And I am sure that this did not happen in most of the special agricultural business leases, SABL, around the country. I think uh, I, I'll just uh, re repeat something that I have mentioned last time about the SABL, this special agricultural business lease. It was in 1979 when the special agricultural business lease, also known as lease-lease-back scheme, 
was created. Now, by leasing the land to the government, a formal title could be granted for the land. This could then be leased back to the landowners and could be used as collateral for a bank loan or as the basis for subleasing the land to a third party development purposes. The subleasing to a third party was supposed to enable customary land to be developed and utilized for commercial purposes. So that was the purpose of this special agricultural bis uh, business agreement. That sub the subleasing of to a third party was supposed to enable customary land to be developed and utilized for commercial purposes. Now, by leasing it to a third party, the concept of the special agricultural business lease or lease lease back scheme was supposed to have the following advantages. Number one, it would provide some financial assistance to customary landowners. Number two, it would allow some development to occur on the vast amounts of customary land which would in turn benefit the economy. Number three, it would bring infrastructure development and other services to remote areas. So, actually, the plan was, yeah, well, we could say it was a good, uh, uh, on paper it was good. Now, the Sikita Mucus oil pump project is being undertaken by Guilford Limited, that is therefore this third party, a wholly owned subsidiary of Rimbun and Hijau, we all use the term RH, Rimbun and Hijau. The project covers a large area of 55,400 hectares, broken down into four blocks, which are owned by four respective local landowners company as follows. Tomata Investment Limited, 15,000 hectares. Ralopal Investment Limited, 11, 300,000 uh, hectares. Natura Investment Limited, 16,100 hectares. Utum Unum Sikita Investment Limited, 13,000 hectares. The manner in which the agreement was entered into was unconscionable. This is the word that has to be made very clear. It was an unconscionable, an unconscionable agreement. This means that the local people were forced to sign the agreement without being given a proper explanation of the agreement and its consequences and without being encouraged to seek independent legal advice. The results are, con are contracts whose terms and conditions favor Rimbun and Hijau to the detriment of the landowners. This has, has had a number of, of very negative consequences. One of these is environmental devastation. Another is the decimation of sacred sites. I made my first visit. Now it's important to realize that this is the background. So I made my first visit to Pomio during Christmas 2010 when I was the coadjutor archbishop of Rabau. At that time, the oil pan project was about to start. In 2013, during one of my pastoral visits to the communities of Pomio Dinari, Individuals and groups of people repeatedly asked me to support them, to speak on behalf of the people with no voice. It must be stated clearly that in that particular case, the church, the Archdiocese of Rabau, do not have any other interest than to bring peace and unity among the people, genuine development for West Pomio and the common good of all. The main reason for getting involved 
was because there was tension and deep division within the Christian community in West Pomio, even within family units. There were some acts of violence, although they were contained, and this must be attributed to the kind nature of the people of West Pomio and to their Christian values and that they have imbibed. I felt, I felt in my duty as bishop to try my very best to unite the people. We succeeded in bringing together the directors of the various landowners groups who signed the ACBL, so this Special Agricultural Business List, and the rest of the people. In the process, I discovered things that I could not imagine. For example, I realized that the sublease agreement negotiated under the ECBL is very unjust to the customary landowners. That's why I mentioned that the agreement was unconscionable. No less than the former Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Honorable Peter O'Neill, on presenting the Commission of Inquiries report to Parliament on September 2013. In other words, there was a, a, there had been a commission of inquiry of what was going on in the ACBL, you know, in the special agricultural business leases around Papua New Guinea. So, uh, when he reported to the parliament, he said it. He said that these reports revealed a shocking trend of mismanagement and corruption at all stages of the ECBL process, and there needed to be change. And he stated, these are the words of the former Prime Minister, we will no longer watch as a foreign-owned companies come in and con our landowners. Con means they fool us. Huh? Chop down our forest and then take the, pro the proceeds offshore. For too long, landowners have been taken advantage of and had their land stolen from under them." Unquote. Now, because I got involved, I have been accused of deceit and of, and of abusing my right as missionary by engaging in sensitive landowner issues. There is no doubt that the issues at hand are indeed sensitive. So sensitive, in fact, that no decent person should allow these things to happen. Some people may ask, is this the job of the bishop? Is this the job of a religious worker? I did ask myself these questions, and I did ask the people why they asked me to speak up for them. I told them, why don't you ask your political leaders? They responded, we don't trust our leaders. We know that the church will not abandon us. Now, can a bishop look the other way? Can a religious worker pretend that these injustices are not happening? To advocate for the vulnerable and powerless, which is the situation of the people of West Pomio is a gospel mandate, just as it is to educate the young and care for sick people. It is the duty of every religious worker and of every Christian for that matter, to give effect to the teaching of, Christian, of Christ in word and action because, in a sense, it's useless to have the social teaching of the church if then we do not try to put it into practice. Of course, there are risks. There could be a price to pay. As, ma as you might know, the administrator of the Archdiocese of Rabau, Mr. Douglas Tennant, was deported in June 2017 because of his involvement in advising me and helping the landowners of West Pomia. Of course, one wonders why some, those who expose this evil 
and unjust practices should be deported, while those who commit them are not. I must admit that I knew nothing about the ACBL when I got involved, and I wonder, this is what I told my listener in that lecture, whether you who are listening to me now know what the special agricultural business list is all about. I learned as I continue my work of mediation, some light came to me when at Mackayen, the chairman of Memalo Holding, Mr. John Palurrea, and some directors agreed to meet with members of the community. During the meeting, mention was made of the need of a new lease agreement because the present one was considered unjust and unfair to the people. Again, that's the reason why we have always considered that agreement as unconscionable. At that time, towards the end of 2014, Mr. Douglas Tennant had just taken up the task of administrator of the Archdiocese of Rabaul. And since he has been a lecturer of law in the University of Papua New Guinea, I propose that he would give me and the community legal advice. Then, on the 24th of May 2015, Pope Francis published his encyclical letter Laudato Si on the care of the common home. I felt that as a bishop it was necessary to respond to the encyclical letter in very concrete and practical way. I did mention this last time in the last uh, lecture, so I, I'll continue, we'll go on. Regarding the third point, that uh, it was to, to helping, helping people to achieve a consensus in the Sikite Mukusu Palm Oil Project in West Pomia. As for, uh, uh, on the second half of 2015, we started asking the people what they considered wrong in the sublease agreement and what they wanted included in the proposed new lease agreement. Mr. Douglas, relying on the input of the people came up with a document that was presented to the people of Mackayen and then explained. A team went from, we call it word to word, or place to place, district to district, in order to get a consensus about the document. We know we have a broad consensus. The document was submitted to Rimbun and Hijau. On the 31st May 2016, Mr. Doug Tennant and myself went to Port Mosby and had a meeting with a high-level delegation of Rimbun and Hijau. And to be honest, I was impressed by the attention given to all the points of our submission, so much so that Doug and I came out of the meeting convinced that uh, Rimbun and Hijau was open to renegotiate a new, bay, a new lease agreement. As time passed, we were reminded by Rimbun and Hijau that the present sublease agreement is a legally binding document. We never denied that. We know that it is a legal document. The question is, is it fair? Is it moral? What the landowners were asking was a renegotiation for a new lease agreement that is fair and just for all, for the developer as well as for the landowners. The great majority of people of West Pomio were not and are not asking for the Sikite Mukus oil pump project to stop. There was a, a, a group, a small group, that would have liked Rimbun and Hijau to get out of completely from Pomio. But the greatest majority of people don't want the project to stop. Rather, they are asking 
through the Archdiocese of Rabaul for a new disagreement that is fair and just, one that respects the environment and that provides the delivery of services to the community. This has been, the, this has been my and the Archidios, Archidiocese position from day one. And we have not changed that. Not only have we never refused to dialogue, but we ask the other party to come to the negotiating table. On the other hand, for a round, round table discussion to bring lasting fruits, it needs three things. And these are again very much part of the social teaching of the church. We must all seek the truth. Lies will lead us nowhere. Secondly, there has to be transparency. And thirdly, there should be no intimidation and bribes. On June 2017, Mr. Dutt Tennant was deported. The accusation against, against him was the blatant, the blatant abuse of, of the conditions of his religious worker visa by engaging in sensitive landowners' issues. I wish to make some com comments about some of these sensitive landowner issues. For example, the sublease agreement negotiated under the ECBL is very unjust to the ordinary landowners and people, and people do not know it. Even those who signed the agreement do not know. For example, people were unaware that the sublease agreement is for 60 years, with the option to renew it for the remaining term of the state lease, which is another 40 years. The question is that the option for the extension is in the hands of Gilford Limited or Rimbun and Hijau, and not in the hands of the landowners. On Friday, 16 June 2017, the national newspaper published an article on the press conference held in Port Mosby on Thursday, 15 June. The article stated, and I quote, the landowners, the landowners that are loyal to that were loyal to Rimbun and Nijau said, the sublease agreement with the developer were due to, uh, for renew only in 2020. And this was conveyed to tenant and to Archbishop of, and the Archbishop of Rabaul, Francesco Panfilo, in May of last year. That was, is what was stated in that press. And and my, my answer is, it is true that the message was conveyed to me and Doug Tennant. However, nothing was said about our response to this, which is that what is going to be reviewed in 2020 is not the sublease agreement itself, which was signed on the 29 November 2010, and will expire on November 29, 2017. But the rental fees, in other words, the sublease agreement is not up for review in 2020. In all our written or oral statement besides, we never use the word review. We always state categorically that what the people want is the renegotiation of a new lease agreement. Regarding the unjust nature of the sublease agreement, it is not just the people of Pomio that say that the existing ACBLs around Papua New Guinea are unjust and unfair. As I mentioned before, already in 2014, the National Executive Executive Council uh, uh, by decision implement uh, there is a number here implemented the commission of inquiry 
into the ACBL report by declaring all special agricultural business leases around the country illegal. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, this decision should affect also the POMIO ACBL. Gilford Limited, therefore, must cooperate and be willing to renegotiate the agreement. Another issue, you know, they were saying that we got involved in labor issues. What are some of the... Another issue, inadequate rental payments are given for the land and the failure to pay rent at all for land for the last two years. For your information, the initial amount that was to be paid as rent to landowners under the lease agreement was the incredibly low fee of one kina, one kina per year per hectare. One kina is about 15 pesos. Huh? This was later amended to kina 140 per hectare per year. <laughs> one kina and 40 toya, 40 cents. There are other rental fees, such as the rental for the land planted with oil palm, which is 13 kina per hectare per year. So you multiply 13 by 15, and you get the value of an hectare eh? uh, planted with oil palm per hectare per year. And there are different tiers when a review of these rental fees will happen. So, they kept on insisting that there was, in 2020, there would have been some review of the rental fees. No, we, we were not interested in the reviews of the, inter, of the rental fees, of the land or this and that. But we wanted a renegotiation of the whole, a new agreement. The third issue, the use of coercive means to apply pressure to get landowners to sign consent form for concession areas. So, for example, as I mentioned they, in the last time, I think, they brought uh, the landowner, the representative, the directors of the landowner's group to the to town, to a hotel, gave them to eat and drink and this and that, and at the end when perhaps you know, the, I, and they did not really know what they were signing, some of them. They signed. Another issue, failure to inform the people about the volume of logs that are usually annually being exported from the project area and failure to pay different and proper royalties rates for different species of timber. Do people know how many cubic meters of logs were exported since 2011 to 2016. Now we are in 2022, so there are another six years, so you can imagine. Huh? But from 2011 to 2016, how many cubic meters of logs were exported almost to, to China? Do people know the value of ki in China of the timber ex exported? from 2011 to the end of 2016. According to the agreement, landowners should receive 10 kina for every cubic meters of log exported. But how could they claim if they don't know how many cubic meters of logs were exported? Now, in Papua New Guinea, there is uh, uh, there is the so Société Générale de Surveillance, SGS, based in Pormos, is a, is a French group, a European group, that has the, these figures, they know, and they provide the government with these figures so that the government can tax. But the people don't know. So, just for uh, summarizing, in, uh, in six years, from the 2011 to 2016, they exported 
260,755 cubic meters of logs in, in, uh, for the value of 330,327,542.27 China. Now, the, for every cubic meter, they should have received 10 kina. So if they exported 1,260,755 uh, cubic meters, people should have received 12 million kina. And these were never, okay. Then another issue, the environmental devastation and the failure to respect sacred sites. I have a document that we, we made an audit of the environmental degradation, which is shocking. Uh, we did it because it will be useful when we have to renegotiate the agreement. Finally, ah, another issue. After six years, there are no significant changes in social and community services. And that should have been one of the purpose of the special agricultural business list. The company boasts about the roads and the seaport at Tree Adrina. The Archdiocese of Rabaul has never denied that there are now roads as well as an operational harbor Adrina as a result of the timber project. Of course, thousands and thousands of trees have been cut down, transported and shipped overseas, and so the roads and the port have to be built. But where did the money come from? Who really paid for them? What else is there to boast about? And finally, another issue, the action of, of the police who stay at the camp sites. The Archivances of Rabaul brought this to the attention of the Ombudsman Commission, and I went personally to meet the, the provincial commissioner, commissioner uh, uh, the, 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 the police commissioner regional and the police commissioner provincial. They visited the area. I invited them to visit the area, and they did. They visited the area together with other four officers. During those days, I, I was also in the area for my Lenten, Lenten patrol. I was very happy about their visit. But I was dismayed when I came to know that during their three days visit, they were the guests of the company. When I asked people whether they were able to let the, the PC commanders know what was going on, they told me, how could we? They were the guests of the company. As mentioned, on the 31st May 2016, Mr. Duck Tennant and I met a team of Rimbun and Hijau to discuss our proposal for an eventual renegotiation of the agreement and sublease agreements. After several months since RH did not respond to our request, on 25 November 2016, the landowners' groups, Tomata, Ralupal, and Makiura, with the help of the Archdiocese of Rabaul, filed legal proceedings against RH. Why? There were two main reasons. To obtain a court order for mediation and to beat the six years statute, statutory limitation period. Otherwise, no one would be able to bring RH to court after the six years elapsed. From March 26 to 27, 2018, a mediation was conducted at Cocopo, that is the center, the town center, to address the issues relating to the Sikite Mukusoy Pan project in West Pomio. The mediation was conducted by external accredited mediator Craig, Craig Jones, who came from Australia. There were positive results from the mediation. For example, Guilford Limited and the landowners' company agreed to renegotiate 
the current project development agreement and sublease agreement in 2020. This mediated arrangement opens the door to effectively address all the issues, concerns and tensions that relate to the project. It allows both parties to negotiate on equal terms and enables the landowners to take the lead in proposing the terms and conditions of the new agreement based on equity, justice, sustainability, and with an emphasis on the need for environmental awareness and protection. Unfortunately, we met steep resistance on the part of our age and there was not much cooperation. And so, on March 1st, 2019, a second mediation meeting was held at Port Mosby. The reason for the meeting related to concerns that our age and its agents were not complying with the terms of the mediation settlement. In particular, there were issues of trying to derail the, the election process, not respecting conservation sites, and not ensuring that correct information was distributed about the mediation. In this second mediation, it was agreed that Guilford Limited, uh, the, that is the company the, uh, uh, of our age, would communicate with the landowners with respect and we will all, and we'll only deal with the landowner company directors with respect to the project. We will respect and maintain conservation areas as per agreements and law, and we will assist in the completion of governance processes. It was also agreed that the parties will not interfere with any landowner company governance processes. This is important. Much concern has been raised about interference. It is important that the election of directors are undertaken openly and, and people can freely choose the people that they want as director based on correct information. It is planned that once the board of directors has been finalized, there will be in July Two meetings with Guilford, one concerning the issues of Pomata, Ralopal and Nakiura, and the other will concern the issues of Ulum Sikite. Well, this was, of course, July, supposed to be July 2019. There are a number of issues such as outstanding rental and royalty payments and accountability for payments made. Also, we need to be moving towards the negotiation of the new development and sublease agreement in 2020. In this regard, we are in the process of undertaking the work necessary for the environmental impact. I have to say that this renegotiation did not take place in 2020 because with the COVID and this and that, and up to now we are in 2022, uh, not yet. The way forward, it has been and continues to be a very difficult exercise. One of the big challenges is the tactics of the company and its unethical influence on the landowners. We are encouraged by the Marape David government commitment to take back PNG. This is the new the one who succeeded to Peter O'Neill as Prime Minister and he vowed from the very start that was just at the beginning to bring back PNG. Unfortunately, I don't think that is happening. A way forward would be for government to oblige a rich and all large companies associated with the special agricultural business lease and other issues concerning landowners land and resources to renegotiate the existing agreements. The approach taken by the Archdiocese of Rabaul is to oblige all large companies. This is our plan. 
not only for the project, because if the, there is going to be a renegotiation of the agreement in West Pomio, then there will be a domino effect in other areas of PNG. And so what uh, our proposal is that the approach taken by the Archdiocese of about is to oblige all large companies, foreign and local, for a complete renegotiation of the agreements based on justice and according to the following project. The, the following point, that there has to be fair rental payments of the land, that there has to be fair royalties for the oil pump, that the environmental devastation is addressed, that policies are put in place to ensure sound environmental practices, that there is proper dialogue between the landowners and the company with regards to the project, and the landowners concern, concern are listened to, that sacred sites are respected, that there is appropriate contribution to sustainable community services by the company, that there are provisions to ensure that the contract is implemented. Another approach is writing a small booklet and that would be the, is a small booklet that we uh, prepare, writing a small booklet, both in English and talk PC, to assist and guide the land, landowners when encouraging such, encountering such difficulties. In fact, one of the issues which is of great concern is the manner in which local landowners can be manipulated and exploited by foreign companies, even big local companies, into entering into agreements with regard to land. Hopefully, such, booklet, such a booklet will help people to become informed by the situation. In conclusion, during the deportation of Mr. Doug Tennant in a press conference organized by RH, it was claimed that the Archbishop and Mr. Tennant continue to propagate divisions among the landowners and landowner company directors. That was what they were saying. The Archbishop and Mr. Tennant were accused of deceit because they are, and I quote, uh, because they are not advocating for the landowners, but rather they are out to permanently stop the desires and aspiration for development of landowners. I wish to assure everybody, and in particular the people of Pomio, that we are not asking for the Sikite Mukusoy Pan project to stop. My only wish is to see the people of Pomio not only united among themselves, but also reconciled. And I will continue to do everything I can, I can to do so. That's why I am convinced that drafting a new lease agreement that is fair and just to all could be the first step towards genuine unity and reconciliation. Unfortunately, the strategy of divide people in order to rule is commonly practiced by greedy and powerful economic groups who want to enrich themselves at all costs. The strategy of the Church, however, is unite people in order to serve the common good of all. Land is a wonderful gift of God. It is our common home. It should bring people together. Instead, is tearing people apart because of greed and pride. The Church has the duty to help people consider themselves as stewards of the land rather than the owner of the land. As believers, we should not look at the land from the point of view of our tribe or clan, but from the point of view of God, who gave the land to all of us, his children. Jesus reminded us 
that we have God as our common father and that this makes us brothers and sisters. Laudato si, number 228. After all, God is the number one Papa Ground, meaning to say he's the owner, he's the creator, because this land and all his resources were in place even before the various groups of people came here. We must tell people to work together, cooperatively and in harmony. The motto of the Archdiocese of Rabaul is Utunum Sint, that they may be one. The motto for our work with Sikita Mucus is one pela ting ting, one pela neck, one pela walk about, which means one mind, one voice, one walk or journey. We would like to be sure that this, uh, we, we would like to be true to this as we move forward together over the next 12 months. Of course, we have to continue. For this reason, I appeal to everyone to put aside personal interest and think about the good of all, especially of our children. What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us? The Church does not have any other interest than to encourage an honest and open dialogue so that particular interests and or ideologies will not prejudice the common good.